pipes this way and it makes me look like humongous that way. Mike, are you ready? I'm ready, yeah. Okay. Wonderful. If I could have everyone's attention, uh, bring the meeting to order. We were waiting for another member of the subcommittee, uh, Councillor Bill Samaras, but he's late. He will join us as soon as he gets here. Roll call, please, Mr. Clerk. Uh, Councillor Chow. Here. Councillor Noon. Here. Councillor Samaras. Two present. Uh, thank you. And, um, this subcommittee meeting was a call to order as a result of uh, three uh, joint motions by myself, by Councillor Nguyen and Councillor Samaras, and, and it is to discuss regarding allowable usage guidance and opportunities for nonprofits from funding of the American Rescue Plan Act, um, uh, short ARPA. And uh, before I continue with the meeting, I just want to also acknowledge uh, other members of the city council, Councillor Rita Mercier, Councillor Dave Conway, and I am um, a welcome uh, members of the city manager's office who are here to make, uh, make a presentation on this matter. And I want to thank all the members of different nonprofits organizations uh, who are here uh, to listen and to um, uh, provide community input into this, this process. Uh, we were going to have, uh, I looked for this meeting uh, many, many weeks uh, before. I understand that uh, Mayor John Leahy has met with the nonprofit organization um, through, throughout the year and um, deal with many different issues. And obviously, um, the offer of funds uh, is the most important one. And I was asked to meet about this before, but I held off until we have this uh, guidance in place. So it would be a much more productive meeting and a productive input uh, from the city manager's office and, and members of nonprofit um, organizations. Um, I don't know if uh, the member have any comments or questions or uh, the councils have comments or questions. If not, we can start with the uh, presentation first. Right. And then after that, we can open up to questions, comments by members of the council body and, also, and then input from the public. Um, Mr. Baldwin, if you would like to start. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> and we'd just like to give a brief presentation uh, to walk through some of the, the guidance and regulations that's, sorry, there's a bit of an echo in here. Uh, the guidance and regulations that have been submitted by the US Treasury to date uh, regarding the American Rescue Plan Act funds. Uh, so we've prepared a presentation that should be showing on your screen in a moment. Thank you. Um, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 uh, was $350 billion in emergency funding. Uh, the funding is for all levels of government, state, local, territorial, and tribal. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the direct funding to Lowell and the specific eligible areas that the funding can be used on, as well as the period of time in which the funds can be used. But there are some overarching themes uh, that guide the eligible uses, and those are listed on your, your screen here. Um, some of those are not unlike the eligible uses under the CARES Act emergency funding, but some are a little more broad, and so I'll just uh, share them with the subcommittee here. Number one, to support the urgent COVID-19 response efforts. That primarily is uh, for public safety workers, very much like the CARES Act was designed to support. Uh, number two, to replace lost public sector revenue. We're gonna talk a little bit more in detail about that. Uh, we see that as a very important component of the legislation for municipalities. It, during COVID, uh, we did see, and we've talked about this in, at the subcommittee level, most specifically in the finance subcommittee, about revenue loss that the city has experienced due uh, primarily to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Number three, to support the immediate economic stabilization uh, for households and for businesses. So this is a little more broad than what we saw in the CARES Act, and this touches upon the community at large, as well as number four, to address systematic public health and economic challenges that have contributed to the unequal impacts of the pandemic. So uh, the eligible jurisdictions, which is just there on the slide, uh, the city of Lowell falls under the metropolitan cities, uh, and then we'll, we'll dive a little deeper into the details there. So on the next slide, we want to talk a little bit more about the money that has been programmed for Lowell. There are two components of the total. One, uh, the city will receive a direct allocation due to its designation as a metropolitan city. That number is 54,450,130. Uh, there is a second component of the funding total which uh, went to cities and towns across the United States to counties, but because the city of Lowell is part of Middlesex County, which is a, a defunct um, county government, that amount was distributed by population. So that amount is 21,527,184. So for a grand total of $75.9 million between the direct metropolitan city uh, allocation and then the county allocation. We have only seen a, a, a portion of the direct metropolitan city amount so far. That is going to be distributed in two tranches. We've talked a little bit about this uh, at the council level. We applied for and received the first half of that funding, and then we will receive the second half of that, as will all other municipalities, one year later. Uh, these two amounts together must be obligated by the end of calendar year 2024, but the actual payments can lag uh, so, so long as they're encumbered before 2024 up until 2026. So now we're going to get into um, more details about the eligible uses of funding. Uh, and we've split them out into these categories consistent with the guidance released by the Treasury. So the number one is support public health response. Under that, there are some uh, more specific categories. Uh, you can see them on the screen here. I'll just kind of read through the top level. Uh, services to contain and mitigate the spread of COVID-19, behavioral health care services, payroll and covered benefits. Again, those are a lot like what we saw as the eligible expenditures under CARES. It is in direct response, uh, pandemic response from municipalities. So, uh, public safety workers, public health workers, um, et cetera, et cetera, testing, vaccination, those would all likely be eligible uses under that category. Um, the second, and I, I'll take a moment just to speak on this um, in a little more detail, is the replacement of public sector revenue loss. So we have, we have performed some preliminary calculations for the city. Uh, the Treasury guidance, and I'll pause for a moment to say that the Treasury uh, released 151 pages of an interim final rule, um, which had a, a ton of information relative to eligible uses about the guidelines around um, these, these categories and expenditures. Um, as it relates to public sector revenue loss, there is a specific formula that's prescribed by the guidance um, where Governments set a baseline revenue as of their, their last full fiscal year prior to the pandemic, and then there is an escalation that is written into the guidance uh, against which the government can compare its actual revenues. And we get four shots at uh, calculating the revenue loss, the first of which would be within this current fiscal year. So we have performed some preliminary calculations. My, uh, my deputy CFO, um, Allison Chambers, is here. Uh, and this is government-wide, so it is not only for the general fund, it is for uh, the enterprise funds in the city for water, sewer, and parking. And altogether, between these funds, uh, the general fund and the enterprise funds, we've come up with about $5.8 million in revenue loss that we can directly attribute to um, the pandemic pursuant to the calculations released in the guidance. So I, I want to stress this point a little bit because of the four opportunities to capture the lost revenue. It is important that the city uh, reserve a portion of future uh, funding 
in order for us to come back and recapture lost revenue in those out years. It, it is not entirely, uh, the revenue in the next couple of years will likely not be the same. There will not be the same loss of revenue due to the pandemic as we get further away from the March 2020 date. However, there likely will be a lingering revenue loss effect. Um, and so it is important that we reserve a portion of the total uh, in order to come back and, and make those transfers back into the general fund so that we can sustain our firm financial footing uh, for the city moving forward, which, uh, which will allow us not to overly burden taxes. Um, so the third category that's on the screen here is water and sewer infrastructure. This is a very straightforward eligible category. Um, the city currently has uh, the third phase of the water and sewer enterprise funds capital plan ongoing. This will likely be something that um, you know will help the city in its efforts to um, separate the sewer system, which has been a very long project for the city. Uh, we have a combined sewer system. We've talked about that many times in the past in the in the council chambers. Um, there is more work to be done as it relates to um, redundancy in the water um, system as well as other components of the water system to maintain um, the quality of the water for, from a public health perspective. And this funding is eligible for use to aid in those capital projects. So moving on to the next slide. Um, these categories start to get a little more broad. Um, so address negative economic impacts, what does that mean? To deliver assistance to workers and families, including support for unemployed workers, aid to households and survivors benefits for families of COVID-19 victims. Uh, the next is support small businesses with loans, grants and in-kind assistance. And then finally, speeding the recovery of impacted industries, including tourism, travel and hospitality sectors. So these are all starting to broaden from the city and its own operations to the community at large. Uh, the next, uh, and this was part of the legislation, premium pay for essential workers. Um, th this is for employees, both public and private sector, who were employed uh, during the pandemic. There is additional guidance that's not included here on the slide, but within uh, the guidance released by the Treasury about certain restrictions on, on this funding. Uh, for example, there is certain um, income eligibility for those employees. It's targeting um, em employees who earn up to 150% of the federal poverty level. Um, so I, I just want to make mention that there are additional restrictions for this category of eligible expenditures. And then finally, broadband infrastructure. Um, this is a, a fairly broad as it's written into the interim, um, the interim rule, how it can be used. It focuses on households and businesses who currently do not have access to broadband. Uh, it can fund projects that deliver reliable service as well as uh, can fund completed broadband, excuse me, broadband investments made through capital project funds. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So we've talked for a little bit about what is eligible, there are also specific ineligible uses of the funding. So the American Rescue Plan specifies that there are two ineligible uses of funds, along with anything that is not specified under eligible uses. So if it is not called out in the guidance as being eligible, it is therefore ineligible. Uh, number one is changes that reduce uh, the tax revenue, reduce net the tax revenue. So the, this, and I'll summarize the, the stuff that's on the screen here, governments are enabled to directly use the funding from ARPA to offset what would otherwise be increases to taxes. Um, and there may be other ways to approach that so as to mitigate tax impacts, but it, ca it cannot be used as sort of a one for one in order to avoid tax increases. And then number two, which is very clear cut, there, there cannot be direct deposits into pension funds. So a community cannot use the ARPA money in order to pay down its pension obligation. Those are specifically forbidden under, um, under the guidance that was released by the Treasury. So 
The distribution process, the expenditures of the allocation will be a multi-year process. Um, the city manager and the administration is engaging the development of a plan um, for these expected funds uh, that are going to entail public outreach and opportunity for community input. I'll take a moment to uh, mention a form that was put up on the website uh, where community members, nonprofits, et cetera, can go to lowellma.gov. Um, they can fill out a form with their ideas for how these, um, how these funds can be used. There are drop downs for the certain eligible categories and they can tell us um, their ideas for the best use of these funds. We've already started to receive a number of, of requests from the community so we do encourage engagement um, at that level. Uh, and then the, the administration will seek to prioritize fiscal stability while maximizing the benefit to the city from this once in a lifetime funding opportunity. Um, we're going to access government operations and community needs to develop a plan, use each revenue source strategically, and then, as I mentioned, prioritize fiscal stability, which is uh, the explicit uh, design of the legislation. So the last slide here, and we, we can put this presentation online for the public to view, but there are some links. Um, one to a informational item that was provided to the council at the last meeting, as well as some links to some of the treasury guidance for organizations or individuals who want to learn more about the process. So um, we're, we're happy to take some questions, um, and, and thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity. Thank, thank you, Mr. Baldwin, for the uh, presentation. Um, I noticed that Councillor Ronnie Elliott just joined us as well. And I just want to make a, a brief comment how exciting this is to see this is the first meeting that we actually have the members of the public joining us in this chamber in about, I think, since, since last March. So uh, welcome back to City Hall. I'm glad to see everyone's uh, face here. Um, that, that's a great presentation, Mr. Baldwin. Um, you know, great summary. The uh, Treasury guidance, 151 pages, as you mentioned, and uh, we're expecting to get um, or have received some, but the total will be $75 million. So um, uh, uh, nice introduction to uh, what to expect. Um, I'm very, very excited um, that uh, the city of Lowell is receiving this much money, and as many um, uh, people have said in the past, this is really a one-in-a-lifetime uh, fund that comes to the city should help us move forward. And this being a nonprofit uh, subcommittee to address the um, the issues, the concerns, the needs of the nonprofits. I also want to say thank you to all the nonprofits. Um, the past uh, 15 months or so, you have done an amazing job in working together with the city, um, taking on tasks that's really um, beyond anybody's expectation. You all have with the housing issues, healthcare access, um, simple things like neighborhood issues, the report, get everybody vaccinated. Um, the city would not look um, this good. I'm, I'm very proud of our city. We, we really come out at the end of the tunnel looking very, very strong. And we would not be in this uh, position without the help and the support of the nonprofit organizations. Um, that, that being said, I um, will open this up uh, if my um, that the member of the subcommittee uh, have any questions or comments um, regarding this issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank all the nonprofits that are here um, tonight, as well as you know, uh, Connors for the presentation, uh, giving a guideline as to how we're going to use this federal money um, to uh, address some of those needed in the city, revenue loss, the infrastructures, uh, sewers and waters, as well as broadband. Uh, one of the things that we have seen uh, uh, highlight throughout this uh, pandemic, the disparity in, 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 in broadband, uh, you know, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, with the kid remote learning. Uh, so I know that a while back I've been pushing to try to see if we can, uh, you know, look, look to the program, the sci fi in, 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 in Salem, uh, that we uh, want to engage in conversation because they plan, uh, they have a plan over there in Salem. So uh, those are some of the things that we need to bring back because so clearly uh, there's a new normal. We're going to probably continue to need uh, some service in High Five. Um, uh, 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 service in uh, small business as well as um, the uh, home uh, for those who cannot afford it. Uh, back to the, uh, the fund, um, I know that um, um, uh, there was talk about uh, what we can use some of this money for. Um, also talk about how we're going to develop a plan. Uh, does that plan involve any input from the community and or nonprofit? 
Yes. Thank you, Councillor. I, I believe that it does, and I think it will be through uh, meetings such as this one, as well as the input you know we may receive um, through the website, as well as as through future council meetings, as as well as any input that individuals may want to send to the city manager's office. That we will uh, best gauge the uh, the desires of the community for the for the future of this money. That's great. That's great. Because uh, um, you know, I, I notice that page five is under eligible use for funding, uh, address the issue of negative uh, economic impact. They seem to really indicate. It seem to really acknowledge the um, the um, the role that nonprofit play in in addressing the inequities uh, in the community. Uh, so um, and that that's good that we continue uh, that we have this dialogue. Uh, with the community and nonprofit, and that will continue to do this because this is not a, uh, a one. This is a one-time fund, but it, it is a, a three-year period to spend this money. Uh, so, um, I, I, if, if I may suggest um, that um, uh, that uh, the best way I would say uh, to approach this is that, that the city council. Uh, I know that certain money is going to put into sewer and water, um, the lost revenue, uh, and other things that we are talking about just now, but the best approach for the city and city manager is to set aside specific amount uh, of this federal fund, right, to address the issues of uh, negative uh, economic impact uh, in that maybe uh, nonprofit uh, can play a role in this. Uh, I, I think that those are something that we have specific amount set aside so nonprofit would have, you know, uh, uh, input in it. And, and then the application, they send in an application as to, uh, as long as it meet the guideline that's set forth by the, uh, the federal uh, government. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Just to uh, uh, comment on, on, that, on that point, this is uh, one of the first meetings. We're going to have ongoing meeting. Um, this is a, a long process, and as the, uh, the presentation stated, uh, we don't have to obligate that the funds until 2024 and to be used, the funds be used by 2026. So we're in it. Uh, we really take the time to really understand what, what the needs of the city, uh, what the needs of the communities are. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that uh, your administration, uh, city manager administration, will have a uh, public meeting as well to get um, um, other stakeholders involved. Uh, to listen to the input and the ideas in addition to nonprofit organizations and I look forward uh, to uh, to that as well and just for the public watching uh, from home or still from the office right now I receive a few texts and phone calls throughout the day um, you know about this meeting they apologize they could m not make it they would like to provide input and so forth and just to uh, remind you um, this presentation will be put online and there'll be a link on the city website for everyone to uh, put the ideas input um, so that way um, we all can share ideas how to make this uh, this funds work um, i'm not quite sure any other members of the council have any comments or or questions um, if not i'm gonna open this meeting to uh, the public or people here um, uh, before this so i just want to introduce um, again everybody knows uh, uh, mr ball which is who just made the presentation Deputy CFO uh, Allison Chambers and uh, Christine McCall from DPD. You steal my mind just from the uh, <laughs> economic development. You did a great job there, and um, I'm sure you'll, you'll do a great job at DPD as well. Um, if you know, it's open to the public, um, if you would like to speak, please uh, raise your hand, come to the podium, um, introduce yourself, state your name, your address. Um, I don't think we have that many people here, so we can um, listen to um, your concerns, your ideas. Um, as long as it takes. John Kim. My name is Elizabeth Cannon. I am the executive director at the Lowell Association for the Blind. Thank you for scheduling this meeting for the nonprofit subcommittee to, to discuss the American Rescue Plan Act. As city councilors, it is important for you to hear from the nonprofits who have been on the front lines as you make strategic decisions regarding this funding. I am also the president of the Nonprofit Alliance, commonly known as NPA, which is a 20-year-old membership organization in Lowell. The mission is to 
strengthen the ability of nonprofits to make our community a better place to live and work. We have members that are small and all volunteer, as well as the largest organizations, including the university. Our members represent a diverse group of nonprofits, ranging from arts organizations to food pantries and shelters and to healthcare organizations. NPA members meet monthly and quickly move to virtual meetings at the beginning of the pandemic. For, the, from, for me, working with the blind, many people have not heard of the difficulties the blind had accessing testing and vaccinations and vaccines. Blind people can't drive to a test, to a drive up test site and had quite a difficulty using the challenging website to schedule appointments. I was talking about these difficulties at an NPA meeting and was able to get in contact with the right person in charge of underserved populations and discuss the difficulties the blind were having getting vaccinated. We were able to host a clinic at our office and for those who attend, were able to attend they were able to get to our office, to a site that was familiar for them, have assistance with filling out the forms that were needed, and were able to talk with friends while waiting to be vaccinated. NPA and the nonprofits of Lowell have worked collaboratively for many years to deliver important services that each, and each nonprofit can tell you of the many stories of the people that they have impacted during this pandemic. NPA and the nonprofits are ready to collaborate with the city and community stakeholders to create a process, a long term vision, and an implement implementation of this important plan. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, for introducing us to your organization. You've done a fantastic job. Um, before uh, you want to speak, you, you come, just want to introduce uh, Mayor John Lee. He's here also to. Um, for taking the meeting. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yun Chen. I'm the executive director of Coalition for a Better Acre. And I would like to thank the nonprofit subcommittee members as well as the um, city councilors that are here um, to give us an opportunity to um, give us to come and speak about some of the things that happened in past 15 uh, months. And as you can see from a number of um, us who are here, we're truly grateful uh, for this important meeting. Um, and our hope is um, for this subcommittee um, to continue to meet, not just in response of a crisis, but also proactively to partner and so serve all the community members of Lowell, especially those community members who may not have voices. So, um, Many of us, um, our nonprofit organizations in Lowell, have been working um, together for a very long time, and it's really exciting to be, uh, be at the table with the city to enhance that partnership and work together to serve other um, half of the community who doesn't always have the voices. Pa past 15 months have been very hard for everyone, not just our staff, but our community members, and, um, our community members that we, who we serve. And today, I would like to share what CBA has been doing during the pandemic, but CBA's story is all of our stories. You can replace CBA with CMAA, CTI, CLHA, MVHP, MVFB, Girls Inc., Boys, Boys and Girls Club, any other acronyms of all of our stories are same. In March 2020, when the Governor Baker shut down the state, we did close our offices, but none of us closed our services to our community members. We all had to pivot our work. Um, to get better understanding of what was needed and what we need, had to do, uh, first thing um, we actually did was to call all of our community members. Um, it took several weeks for CBA staff to call over 600 families um, in the city of Lowell to really understand what are the needs. Of course, 
we know that everyone knows that there were certain basic needs that were important to, um, to our um, community members because within a couple weeks, a lot of our families were running out of food. We started delivering foods, but we didn't just um, deliver foods. What, um, what some of these families needed was they needed diapers, they needed cleaning products, and masks were very difficult to get. PPE products were very difficult to get, and many of us worked together in partnership with Community Foundation. Uh, we're grateful for their donations that they gave us and their products that they, were, um, they gave us to be able to deliver these to our community members. And once the school decided that they were going to do um, online um, school for um, children, initially, um, a lot of people didn't have laptops for their children. And they didn't have Wi-Fi. When the school decided that they were going to give uh, laptops and hotspots to the children, our parents didn't know how to um, teach our children um, to help them with the remote learning. Once we, um, once we worked with our parents, grandparents, and caretakers how to help their children to do remote learning, we learned that there were other things that were needed. They didn't have printers at home, so we provided printers. And many families didn't have um, spaces for children to do their work because there were multiple children in the households. So uh, many of us also provided headphones so that um, they can have a little more privacy um, to learn. Um, some of our um, family, uh, some of our community members had to give up their job because they didn't have a childcare and they didn't have flexibility of working from home. Many didn't know how to fill out unemployment paperwork. Many were falling behind their rent. We helped them with um, their, uh, their rent. We helped them fill out raft application. And we helped them out, uh, fill out unemployment. Both raft and unemployment uh, paperwork it was a very long process. And many never received any money from either unemployment or raft to support their rent. We provided education about COVID. We helped our community members to get access to vaccine. A lot of great information came out of the city, but it all came out in English. Many of our organizations worked together to translate those information, and we got information out to the community, to especially to hot serve community. Um, there were times we would get, especially when vaccine was difficult to get, we would get an email from the city saying there are 30 vaccines that's available at, the, um, at this um, senior center. However, it came out in English. By the time we translated into other languages and got it out, they were no longer available. A lot of us pivoted our pivoted our work and created online programs to continue working with our children, workforce development training programs. We created new programs to, during pandemic to, to meet the needs of our community. When, when the local foundation who provided turkey baskets to our families every year, and because of pandemic, they decided that they no longer would be able to do that and many of us work with families that relied on those baskets. A lot of organizations uh, partnered with Merrimack Valley Food Bank to get turkeys, and we made baskets for families to make sure that they had food. I got calls from a lot of different people day before Christmas. I actually, as a matter of fact, I got a call day before Christmas from um, Councilor Chow about a family who needed food. And a lot of places were closed, and I actually went shopping and delivered food for the family to make sure that they had food for the holidays. And this is just a glimpse of the work CBA has done, and this is a glimpse of the work all of us here have done during the pandemic. And we're here. Um, we, we provided and we pivoted our work, and we want to make sure that city knows uh, city hears from those of us that have been working so closely with with the community and get an input of what is really needed for our community because what we think the community need is not always what they really need and um, i've actually heard on the radios and many places that nonprofits are looking to get piece of pie 
And I don't think any of us are here for that. Um, what we want is we want to make sure that the resource, uh, resources are going to the community members who doesn't have a voice. Um, earlier, um, Mr. Baldwin um, talked about survey to get a community input, which is very, very important, and I'm really excited that city is looking for an input. But is that in other languages? Is that translated in other languages? You know, so how are you getting input from the other 50% of the um, community members who may not have access to the websites, the computers, and not who are not able to communicate? So um, I'm actually really excited, um, you know, that this is a process and cities willing to um, listen and hear from the community and I hope that there are some uh, forms, uh, uh, formats where community members can come and talk about what their needs are and city can make a good choice about um, how to spend the money. So thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Yun Chu Choi, for your presentation. I want to welcome uh, Council Samaras, member of the Nonprofit Committee. Um, is here, and also I see a representative from Lloyd Trahan, Congresswoman Lloyd Trahan is here, Sarah Kuhn, uh, welcome to the meeting as well. Um, uh, you are representing CMA today? Yeah. Or from CMA, yes. What you got on, welcome as well. Uh, welcome. I just want to apologize for coming in late, but I think anybody that goes down Thompson Lake knows Route 3 traffic can be. <laughs> A parking lot, so I apologize, but uh, Andrew, thank you for your presentation. But we've talked in the past, and you brought up some salient points that must be discussed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to make one quick comment on uh, Yun Chu Choi. Uh, you took the comments right out of my mouth. Um, you've done a fantastic job, uh, a jack of all trade during pandemic, um, like many other organizations you mentioned. Any of the organization could exchange the acronyms and uh, just doing things are not normally that you would do. And one of the things I was impressed with was um, a family reached out to me um, right before, on a weekend. Um, they just got laid off, um, didn't have any more benefits coming in, didn't have food for, for, the, for the weekend. And uh, I called you to pick up the phone um, and we, we, we spoke and you delivered the food to the family. They were so thankful. They, um, they couldn't believe it. They had food for the weekend until uh, Monday where they could reach out to whatever other resources were, were available to them. So um, I, I give to all the nonprofits to you that just have done an amazing job um, with the city. Thank you. Um, Councilor Samaras. One more question to Yangju. You talked about uh, children you know, receiving uh, computers and, and what have you but not having the hotspot to do it and or not, not having the printers and what have you. Um, how do you feel that your relationship, our, our relationship with the school department is? In other words, do you have any suggestions to ensure that the most in need do get looked at immediately, not after the fact? Uh, we have some concerns about that. I do have a comment for that. Yes. If you'll allow me to speak. Sure. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking this time. Uh, my name is Diego Leonardo. I'm the president and executive director of Lionette Community Center for Empowerment. We're a nonprofit, a young nonprofit that focuses on education. And by means of education, we can create socioeconomic development, participation in the civic engagement, as well as um, socioeconomical growth. One thing that I would like to mention is about communication. And before getting into communication, I would like to read you a um, quote that says, communication is the act of developing meaning among entities and groups through the use of sufficient mutually understood signs, symbols, and semiotic conventions. This is pretty much what I'd like to talk about, a two-way communication system. We know that sometimes we tend to trust the people that is close to us, but this is the way that we can create communication and building a community. If we can communicate in a way that everybody is included, that can create a notion that the community can get engaged. And for that, to answer to your question, um, Councillor Samaras, we do provide communication services. As part of, of organizations and nonprofits, we are working as a collective, not as an individual to create competition. We want to just create a coalition that all communities can be included regardless of their race, their country of origin, 
the language they speak, age, and gender. One thing to take in mind is that um, by providing funding, we can allocate funds in a way that it can be easily transmitted to people that it's in need. One way that I see nonprofits working is the use of a nonprofit gets to the gaps that city government doesn't really fill up. This is why I'm here advocating for you to use us as a resource to really communicate in a way that we can understand what is coming from the city as well as you understand what are the needs from the community. So we can create that two-way system that by listening, you can uh, help us, and us listening, we can help you. And that's the way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Diego, for the presentation. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, my name is Marcy Anampiu. Uh, this is the first time I speak in front of uh, the City Council. I'm from Lowell Community Health Center. Madam Rita Marcia, I'm not at Marshall's. Yes, we met at Marshall's the other day. I'm so happy to see you. Uh, so I'm here from Lowell Community Health Center. Uh, I'm the Senior Director of Community Engagement. I'm not a stranger to the city. Uh, I'm here a lot of times uh, just advocating for our needs. Uh, and when I was asked to speak, I was not shy because I think that if I don't speak uh, on behalf of our community and the health center, who I know you love so much and know all we do, so I will not tell you about the health center, but I'll just tell you that uh, we're here. Uh, Yoon, when you're speaking, you spoke to my heart because everything you said, I have done as a community health worker in the last year. Everything you said, Yoon, our community health workers have done. So when one community uh, organization speaks, they're not speaking just for themselves, they're speaking for the collaborative. So we are one group of people that is very uh, coordinated. We've been with uh, Mayor Leahy pretty much every Tuesday evening. It's, uh, it's so interesting that today is also a Tuesday evening and we're here speaking to you guys. So we've been here all through since March. So I am here to say that COVID-19 has been with us for a very short time. Believe it or not, it feels long, but it's been here for a very, very short time. However, it has left a permanent mark on each of us, including the city at large. And this mark is going to be here for a long time. Some of the impacts of the pandemic will never go away. Some might go away, but others will never go away. And we can get into details about some of the impacts that will never go away. Some of them are, are very, very painful for us as community members and as family people. The ARPA funds are here also for a short time. 2024 to 2026 is the time we're gonna spend them in a span of about two years. We can make choices that will last us a long time. Just the same way the pandemic has been here a short time, leaving us with the uh, impacts that are long lasting, the funds can also go a long way. We therefore request, excuse me. We therefore request that the funds are utilized wisely and thoughtfully, both for recovery, which is great, and more so for trans transformation. Transformation that will be felt by the entire community of Lowell. We request that the com committee considers uh, a, 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 a vision that is shared, similar to what we've talked about. It's not about us, it's not about you, it's about all of us. So a shared vision, something that is inclusive, a decision-making process that is inclusive of the entire community. We elect you so that you can represent us. So we want an inclusive process. We also request that you ad address the underlying disparities that have been brought to the forefront by the pandemic. Most of them you know, but I'll mention a few of them. Economic, social isolation, health access. Believe it or not, as, as much as I'm a healthcare provider, health access has not been accessible to everybody. Health access has been an issue. COVID testing has been an issue. COVID vaccines have been an issue. Not because they're not there now, but it's still not accessible to everybody. 
discrimination, isolation has been, an imp has been something that has been here for all of us. Being locked up in a house, not being able to live, and what does that do to your mental health? How do you feel not having Thanksgiving? Father's Day last year, Christmas last year, Thanksgiving, Easter, and then isolation that is ongoing for some of our members that don't have choices. Isolation is an everyday thing for them. Housing. Housing, employment. I wish TTI was here. They would really tell us something about housing. And a lot of social determinants of health that we don't usually talk about. Social, social determinants of health are things that really impact our health that have nothing to do with health insurance and being able to go to the hospital. It's all these things that affect who you are. Like for example, being an immigrant or a refugee has a disparity on you just by the mere fact. Even if you have insurance and you have a good job, you may have uh, social things that happen to you that affect your health. If you're not employed, if you're not well educated, if you speak a second language, those are some of the social determinants of health we are talking about. We therefore request an equitable process in the distribution and allocation of the resources, uh, one that pays close attention to those adversely impacted by the COVID-19. These are some, the same populations that we are representing. We serve these groups and know them and know their pressing needs because we work them every, with them every single day. Elizabeth mentioned the NPA, it's an organization of about 40 agencies. How strong is that? And it's 40 agencies that reach a, the whole breadth of the city. So we are here to help you. The pandemic will eventually go away. I really pray and hope that it does go away because we are very close. When I see myself without a mask here with everybody, I know the pandemic is gonna go away and I pray that that day is coming soon. So let us please make a good choice that will be here and that will be, we will all be proud of. One we can look back to and know that we did the right thing. And I thank you all very much. Thank you for that presentation, very thoughtful, thank you. I'm Joe Hungler, um, 178 Loose Street. I'm also the executive director of the Boys and Girls Club. But as Jean Ju said, I, I, you know, we're not all gonna give the laundry list of, of what we did during the pandemic. I, I wanna speak to a few things, one of which is the disparities that Mercy touched on. As somebody who lives um, in Belvedere, a lot of my friend group I saw struggle during the pandemic. However, their struggles included having good Wi-Fi included, having good headsets for their kids, or if they didn't, they got them on Amazon a couple days later, um, having enough devices, and some of the isolation things that everybody dealt with. When I went to my job, I saw a lot of families living in the Lower Highlands and the Acre and across the city who did not have some of those pieces in place. They couldn't access things online. Um, they didn't have good internet speed when it came time to go to school. Uh, you know, a lot of the folks at our daycare, their parents work white collar jobs. They could work from home. If you're working a low income job in a service industry, which is where a lot of low income jobs are, you can't work from home. And like during school, we had a lot of kids who were making a choice of, do, do we uh, leave our kid home alone? Are they old enough to be home alone? Or do we, um, go to work, and it's just a very different environment. The broadband access is definitely an issue. I mean, the amount of times that with good broadband, we occasionally had issues at my house, because my wife and I were both trying to be on Zoom calls, and especially there's a presentation going on, and if you have poor Wi-Fi, it, it, it's brutal, and for a kid that's hard to engage to begin with, and every, every, every kid is hard to engage online, right? So if it's hard to engage, and then all of a sudden you, you take all these other pieces, it's just really hard. And that's why we opened up t to have kids at the club to do the remote learning when the schools weren't able to be open. And we found a lot of pieces there where we became um, uh, an assistant to the parent with appropriate confidentiality um, approved, where we would be the ones the schools would reach out to to say, hey, you know, can you help this kid with his um, headphones and those kind of things. And 
I know how many people, like, you get one person on a call who doesn't have a good headphone, and you get really frustrated because you can't hear what they're trying to say. Well, for the kid that has that bad headphone, after the class says to them, what did you say three times? They shut down. And if they already have disadvantages, that just goes farther. And I could give a, tons of examples. When, when families would come up with the grab-and-go meals, we would talk to parents, and they didn't have food on weekends, or they didn't have this, they didn't have that. And as Jean-Ju said, we would try to find ways to get what they needed. Um, and we had some great donors that helped us do that. The Community Foundation, I would like to echo the shout-out that they got. But as you go through this process, I really ask that you look at how we systemically change things. So yes, there's a lot of one-time needs, the revenue shortfalls that, uh, that everybody had. But how do we systemically change things so that the world is a little more equal? You know, we, we are a city of immigrants, and I've, I've heard just about everybody in this room celebrate that. And it's one of the reasons I love living here. Um, and I think that, you know, Yunju and, and uh, Mercy and others spoke to the, the language issue. It was the first thing I thought about when I saw the survey come out today. Um, you know, and we certainly will represent our families and, and listen to them and try to get that out. But we are happy to uh, host, and I'm willing to bet most of these nonprofits are willing to host community meetings. We'd love to have some forums to get to the people um, there and uh, see if we can find some translators to do that as well, because I do think that there's so much that gets missed. Um, you know, we know at the club we have 21 languages spoken, and uh, we don't have ad adequate um, language skills on our staff. We have six or seven languages spoken on our staff, and we have some texting apps and things like that, but it's not the same as having that many people. We only have 30 people on staff, so it's hard to have 21 languages among that. So we know it's challenging, but it's important and it's critical. And maybe that's where a, a chunk of this money goes to, is to help our translation services moving forward. Because for a portion of the city, so many things we do to, to, to take care of everybody, um, and I know many of you who I've seen do awesome constituent service can't do it with certain folks because of translation issues, right? So that's incredibly important. But I really think that the other piece is just looking at the systems, looking at how this money can systemically change things moving forward to make things uh, more equitable. So the next time we have a pandemic, or whatever the next crisis is, or even day to day, to make sure our educational outcomes are more equal, to make sure that our um, jobs and housing are more equal. It's not, the inequality is not because some folks have, are smarter than others or, or, or whatever it is, it's just about equal access and equal opportunity and a level playing field. So I ask that you look to be systemic and look at the inequalities that are there to see if we can use this money to transform that. And, um, and the last thing is, I would, I would ask if you would continue these uh, meetings so we can continue to, we want to work with the city and we want to be a partner with the city. I, I, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think that uh, most nonprofit leaders that I've talked to want to work with the city and be a partner in, um, whether it's this money or whether it's two years from now when this money is already allocated and gone, how we can work together to, to, to work on, the, on a lot of these same issues. So we would like to, uh, I know that the pandemic slowed things down, but the nonprofit subcommittee hasn't met in a while. I would love to have this be an ongoing meeting if that is uh, something that's possible and that uh, we can partner with you. Thank you, Joe. Do we have anybody else who would like to uh, speak from, from the public? We still have some time. Uh, thank you so much, um, everyone um, that uh, came to the podium and uh, speak. Uh, very, um, you, you done an amazing job. But some of the stories you you told, uh, the things that you do that we that are not part of your mission statement, that are not on the social media, um, that we hear today, um, very very touching. And I hear from other people that, that you all have, have done that, things that uh, people don't know about. Um, just for example, like Joe reaching out uh, to kids with even with toys around Christmas, um, with, with, with the food to different families and all the nonprofits, just do many, many different things, reaching out to different people. And behind the scene, you all work with other nonprofit um, organization members because you share a lot of the same goals, which is really to, to help the community to help the families, to, to help the children survive 
um, that was really the forefront for the past 15 months in the beginning. Uh, we were all just trying to survive the, the, the virus. And that, that created a lot of anxiety, a lot, a lot of stress, and you came together on your own, try to see what you can do to, to help the rest of the, of, of the community. I, I really appreciate that, the council body, I um, appreciate uh, for what you have done. Um, I don't know if other members of the council have any more questions or, or, or comments. Sure, Councillor Samaras. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation tonight. A couple of questions, and anyone can answer it. Joe, you talked about, you know, we should have systemic change. In other words, you can't use the same old, same old. Life has changed, in other words, to be more inclusive and what have you. Uh, how do you see your, your groups being able to help us do that? I mean, and, you, and I'll go to you actually talked about, uh, you know, more us either whether we host more meetings or do we have the meetings here with the subcommittee or is there a commission that should be formed? I mean, one of the quickest ways is through a subcommittee. It really is because most of the members of the city council do show up uh, and, uh, you know, it's, so it's not nothing repetitious and everybody develops their own ideas and ways of dealing with these things. But this pandemic has certainly changed life as we know it. There's no question about it. Uh, the use of uh, technology has jumped 20 or 30 years because of this. But there are a couple of things. So back to you, Young Ju, was you talked about some of the students, though, not even though they just didn't have enough of the information or the parents to be able to supervise their education at home. So we need to know how you can help us with more quickly identifying those issues with the school department. And Joe, for you, it's, it's if we're gonna make some of these changes and you have suggestions, what's the best approach? Do we have, uh, do we start with monthly meetings or something like this? Uh, it's a yearly meeting or do we set up a commission? It's, it's a, it, this is an opportunity to make things happen. But the thing is, there are a lot of nonprofits in this city, so it, it's, we just can't have a, like a tent show. It, it's gonna be how, and the other gentleman talked about communicate, the importance of communication, communication and the right type of communication. So how do we, we need some ideas on how to do this that would be beneficial to you and allow the city to do its job in a way that, uh, meets all of the needs of our constituents. I think some of the work has been started by the school department, um, having um, the, the bilingual liaison um, um, department right. um, has been um, instrumental and um, um, having them go out to the community and um, educating the parents of how to maneuver. Um, so um, during our pandemic, we actually started a, um, a virtual a parenting university. We partnered with one of the professors from UMass Lowell, and we had 10 families that went through the um, six week program to learn how to uh, maneuver the resources that's available and understanding about parenting advocacy groups and when they have questions, where to go. So I think more of those, um, I know the school system has been talking about parenting university type of um, programs and having those type of um, resources for our families will be very helpful. Um, as a um, immigrant myself and coming to this country when I was young, my parents didn't know how to maneuver the school system. And uh, for me, it was um, single swim. <laughs> And you know, luckily that you know, um, myself and my sisters were able to do that, but not everybody is able to do that. And having more of a wraparound services for families um, would be very helpful. And, um, and um, as I think you know, we all talked about is, um, how do we make sure that the voices are heard? So when we talk about community, um, I think what we talk about community is very different from what others may talk about community, and they are both community. Well, they are all community members, right? Yeah. But you know, we tend to talk about the other half of the community that um, um, low, lower income and maybe immigrants and refugee uh, families or with language accesses, and how do we make sure that their voices are being heard um, so that 
when the um, funds are being dispersed that it's equitable. And I can give an example of uh, parks. You know, I know there's a lot of talk about um, uh, redoing Collie Stadium, which is wonderful. I think you know it's definitely something that is a very you know good way to use some of the funds. But what about some of the other funds that are in lower income area? For example. Um, Roberto Clemente um, Baseball Park, for example, doesn't have lights. It actually doesn't even have a porta party. And we actually um, had to run around looking for someone to donate a porta party for the kids to use um, for, for the uh, baseball season. So, how do we make sure that you know, the funds are being used equitably? in all the areas, not just in the um, areas where people call all of you and you know, you know what their needs are, but what about those people that are not calling you? Because there are a lot of people, that, you know, for every person that calls you, there are probably two, three people that are not calling you. And those are the people that we work with. So um, that's why I think it's important for us to help the city to bring those voices to you, whether it's in a format or for us representing their voices um, so that you can hear the voices that are not being heard. So thank you. Well, that, and that's what I'm talking about is the process. Okay. Um, so I think that you're right. That is the hard part is the process, right? So I, I think that translation is part of it, making sure that people can feel like they're, they um, can have a voice if, they, if, if that's a struggle for them. You know, um, Connor's presentation was great. And, and I will say I want to thank Dave for, for, for uh, Council Conway, I'm sorry, for passing around the, uh, the presentation because it was so uh, densely packed I wouldn't have gotten it. But if I didn't speak or read English, I would have really, uh, really been in the dark. Um, so I, I do think that that's a piece of it. And um, I also think there's a lot of folks that aren't going to come to City Hall that um, don't necessarily feel that uh, either, either for transportation reasons. I know a few years back uh, when I first came to the city, there was a lot of times that there'd be uh, city leadership that would go out to the um, and have neighborhood meetings, and I think that um, you know it would be important to do that again, again with translation services, um, and I think that the schools the same type of thing, at the, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic when parents were scrambling of like how do I get my kid in, what do I do with this, how do I figure out the the laptops, uh, they had a lot of and I forget the term uh, that they're called, but they had people who were specialists in Portuguese or Khmer or whatever it might be. And um, they help parents, but they weren't enough. They just were overwhelmed in, uh, in doing that. And I think the other thing would be um, finding a way for the whole community to be, uh, have, have more representation. So when you walk into City Hall, uh, at least pre-pandemic, I haven't, uh, this is the first time I've walked into City Hall in a while. Um, you know, it do, the, the city doesn't, it feels more representative of me than it does of the people that I work with at the club. And I think that, uh, you know, I know HR art is happening to, to work on that, but I think that, um, and I don't think anybody's making an individual decision of like, we're not gonna hire that person because of how they look, but overall, our city um, employment does not reflect our community. So that means that when you walk in, if everybody looks like me, then you feel very comfortable when you walk in because they, but you feel reflected. If that's not what's happening, then it's going to be harder for people to walk into this building and feel like they have a voice. Because um, you might be told you have a voice. One thing that I've definitely found during this pandemic and with a lot of the DEI process we've done at the club is that there's a lot of things we have to say out loud. There are things that I, you know, I, I like to be very welcoming and supportive of folks, but I definitely learned that there are things that I have to say out loud. And I had to say to our staff that if you're gay, it's okay to be out because some parents aren't comfortable with it. And I just assumed that that was true. We had multiple gay staff and some of them were out. And, but when I said it, all of a sudden a bunch of staff were really relieved that I said it because they said, oh, it's okay. And I think that's something, whether, it, whether it's around being gay, whether it's um, you know, the color of your skin or the fact you're an immigrant or that you don't speak the language, I think sometimes we have to say those things out loud because just because we have good hearts doesn't mean the world knows we have good hearts. So it's really important to say those things out loud to show that this is um, a welcoming community. And I know this council is always prided 
itself on wanting to be a welcoming community, but I think that we have to make sure that we're explicit about it and that we, um, and that our actions follow those words. So I think those are some of the things that I would say. But I do think getting out into the neighborhoods would uh, get more feedback from, I think from the folks city manager on is bringing this information out to the neighborhood groups. But I would just finish with something that you said, or Young Ju, is that if you as nonprofits could uh, perhaps set up area meetings with some of the nonprofits working together and inviting the city to be part of that process. So we come into your home, your home as, uh, like I said, rather than some people are apprehensive about coming into the, into City Hall, but we most certainly would not be apprehensive about going into, you know, any area that you would suggest. Yeah, I, I would think that we would be willing to do that. And I, you know, obviously everybody has their own COVID protocols and all, and all those kind of things. And I don't want to speak for folks, but I'm guessing that people would be happy to, uh, to host those meetings and to, uh, to bring people out uh, to do that. Thank One thing I do want to echo, and I'll be quick, is um, Yunju uh, or somebody mentioned um, some of the work that the schools were doing. And I think that uh, one of the things I appreciated when they were in the auction or the lottery of who got in where is that they prioritized the kids that wouldn't have access. And, you know, just the fact that they were paying attention to the kids who had lower scores or had special needs or had other challenges, I thought was a, was a wonderful thing to see that that's where we were focusing because that's where the need was. So. All set, Council Um I want to also acknowledge Councilor Drinkwater was just here a second ago. Uh, we have time for uh, Councilor Noon and then Councilor Elliott. Thank you, Ms. Thank you Ms. Mr. Chairman. Um, Young Shu, it's good news. Um, the Council just voted in the capital plan uh, the capital loan for the Roberto Clemente Field, and we're also looking for a matching grant from the state. So that, that fund is half a million dollars, and a ha matching fund maybe do more than just uh, the, the light in the park. I'm excited, very excited, Young Shu. Uh, so uh, as we said, you know, we, we, we acknowledge about the impact of the pan pandemic on the community, on the resident. You know, as we rebuild, I think we must work toward equity, I heard about that. I heard about equity in education, equity in employment, and equity in healthcare for all of low residents. And that's what this council uh, are going to do. And this council really, uh, this council and this city, um, and I agree with you that uh, you have a role to play in this. And that's why the chairperson for the nonprofit, you know, set up this, this is the first meeting. It's not going to be the last. It's gonna be many more to come. And as councilor, uh, um, Samaras indicated that, look, maybe the chair, we talk to the chair, and if the chair willing to take it to the nonprofit, and the nonprofit then talk to each other, bring their, resident, their, their clientele, the, the resident, to those meetings so that we meet you where you are. So thank you for tonight. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Diego, I'm going to have Councillor Elliott go first, and then you all go last, if that's okay. Yeah. You can go. You want to, uh, do you go to go first or you want to? It, it, doesn't, ma <clears throat> it doesn't matter to me. Mine's more just a uh, line of Well, question. I call on you and then. Sure, okay. So, um, so I think this meeting is helpful um, just in terms of continue to try to identify uh, <clears throat> the parameters of the uses of the funding. Uh, what we do know is that the needs are great and we have a multitude of needs. I like the fact that the city administration is going out if I, if I heard correctly, the city is going out with an, a request for proposals to organizations to solicit information, to submit, is that, I know I was a little bit late, but is, is, that's my understanding. And I think we're gonna hear back from the nonprofits who know best what the needs are, what programs they run, um, what funding they need to achieve the goals that we've heard them discuss tonight. So I think it's, it's a very good first step whether we go to the Nonprofit Alliance meeting, the subcommittee itself for city councils. I think that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we all have our opinions on what the needs are in, in the city. Um, I think Lowell Community Health Center, um, and it's not being overlooked, but I think they're in this time of isolation for any age group, our seniors, our children, uh, adults, you know, the toll that it has taken on mental health I think is significant in this community and across the nation. Uh, I look forward to seeing what those needs are and how we address it because I think as 
um, as she mentioned, I'm sorry, I, I just, we just met, so forgive me if I don't know any, but I do think that is an area that is pervasive throughout the community, and it is multifold, and it should warrant significant attention, not just, um, even pre-COVID, we had a lot of mental health um, throughout, throughout the community, and I think it warrants significant attention, in my opinion. So we'll be looking to those organizations that can provide, that can enhance, and provide those services to the community. And I think, um, I think that's a great need. So um, it'll be a long discussion. Uh, just one question to Con. 2024, is that when the first opportunity to literally expend money, or is that the deadline when the first round has to be expended? That's the deadline for uh, obligation of the obligation fund. Obligation of yeah. the funds. The last date for expenditures is 2026. Okay, that's the last day. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. So um, those, are my, those are my thoughts. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it will, $76 million is a lot of money. That's, it's a good problem to have, but it is a challenge to, to address so many issues that we're looking to address um, with that money. And uh, one thing I do know about the city, we do things and partner extraordinarily well and I think we're going to set the gold standard when it comes to this and how we can embrace um, our nonprofits, um, address deficits, revenue, um, you know, all the issues that have been discussed here. So uh, look forward to, to these meetings and as we navigate how we can, we can come out on top and provide the services to the people that need them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Also, want to welcome uh, City Council Acre District uh, candidate Paul Ratayam. Welcome to the meeting, um, Mr. Diego. For the light of me, I cannot say your last name. It's really cool, but I can't say your last name. <laughs> Leonardo. <laughs> what is it? Leonardo. Leonardo. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Here you go. Uh, so one thing that I want to mention is that we tend to forget that when we talk about communities in need, we usually think about communities that are very needy or poor. But we also need to enter in a way that we can exploit the talents that are in the community. And this community has a lot of talent. There is a lot of things that we can improve in ways that we can just give the voices and the revenue to people that it, ne it needs it to create that uh, growth. So that's something I just want to mention. I don't just want to leave without saying that we have a lot of talented people, but we don't have that communication system that can allocate the way for voices to be heard in a way that can be um, equitable. That uh, in last thing to say is that um, we're really here to collaborate again. Um, usually we think of the capitalist model of competition where we just a collaboration. And with that collaboration being said, I'd like to also invite the city manager to participate with us so that communication can also be allocated in a better way. So it can be responsive for the blind, can be responsive for communities that don't speak English, as well as some other communities that need some language access that can have uh, accessible information coming from City Hall. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you. Would you like to speak? <laughs> Would you like to uh, speak? Hi. Hi, everybody. My name is Mary Taurus. I live uh, on Royal Street in Lower Highlands neighborhood. I'm currently working as a part-time coordinator for Lowell Votes. So, of course, part of my mind is also in, in terms with communication um, in a lot of ways is also with this new system in place. But that's just in the back of my head. With everything uh, through the reflective proce process, reflective practice that we're going through um, on the impacts of the pandemic, you know, I, I so appreciated the, um, the note that this could be an opportunity for transformation. There's a lot of... Uh, change that's going to be coming in in a lot of ways that the city could be considering. But in terms of communication, I just want to hold that the vast majority of the community doesn't follow necessarily what all is entailed with running the city, right? They don't know, a lot of people don't know how the city council structure works and the school committee, the new system, all of that that's changed at all, but also that there are neighborhood groups so when we say that we're going to go to the neighborhood groups, that's missing, that's got to be missing 90% of the population. So we have plenty to talk about, and I'm really looking forward to all the opportunities to do that. Thank you. 
Thank, thank you, Mary. Um, even though we're pressed on time, we do have a couple of minutes. I know there are a few members here that um, may be thinking about speaking. Um, does anybody else want to go last? Um, if not, um, we're, we're running uh, right on time before the regular city council meeting. Um, I want to thank again everybody for, for coming to uh, speak uh, today. It's very meaningful to hear uh, not only what you do for work, but also to, to hear your voices, to hear your heartfelt um, mission um, and to the organizations that you work for and you work for the communities and, and the people in your, in your neighborhoods. Um, as we stated in the beginning, uh, this is one of the many more meetings that we are going to have, whether through this nonprofit, some committee, or the city manager's office reaching out uh, to the public directly, uh, with members of the community and other stakeholders. Um, we we want to make sure, as one of the speakers uh, mentioned before, we want to be very thoughtful, we want to be very thorough, uh, we want to be able to distribute uh, the funds equitably um, to the communities, to the people that are impacted the most through COVID-19. Uh, we're going to want to make sure that our city uh, responds and accommodates and um, you know hear the, the needs of, of the community. Um, since I don't know if my uh, uh, co-members have any more comments, but I would suggest that I'm not going to adjourn this meeting. I'm going to leave it as a continuance so that way we don't have to make another motion to hold a subcommittee meeting uh, when uh, maybe in a few more weeks once everybody have a chance to look at the presentation or the information on the website and provide some input, um, comments, and ideas then uh, we will call another nonprofit subcommittee meetings. Um, it's better to have meetings when everybody has the information available out there so we can make thoughtful comments and um, for us council members too, for us to be, um, to be more informed as well, uh, to be more prepared as well. So with that said, I'm going to ask for a uh, continuance of this meeting for a future time and date. Mr. Clerk, do we need to um, make a motion for that or just for a continuance? Yeah, just, just, second. just a continuance. Second. Uh, second by Council Samaras. Thank you so much. Meeting continue.